Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I'm interviewing Jen Trapak. She's an optimal health coach, business consultant, and host of the podcast Salad with a Side of Fries. Jen grew up in Michigan, and she was the skinny one in a family of dieters, which was awesome until it went away. And so began her weight management saga. Ultimately, Jen learned the nutrition basics that are being overpowered by fancy protocols and biohacks that aren't sustainable. Jen is on a mission to demystify how food works in the body and help people help themselves. With over a decade of working with clients, Jen started Salad with a Side of Fries podcast, which is hilarious, and she decodes food research and gets real on the basics you need to know to simplify your relationship with food. In this podcast, I get to pick Jen's brain on the most common food trends and health issues I see related to food. And my goodness, she blows my mind with some connections I never thought of. I have no doubt you're going to learn a bunch from Jen's experience with coaching clients of all ages on food. So let's introduce you to Jen Trapak. Hey, health junkies. I have a fun podcast for you all today. I have Jen Trapak on and we're going to be talking about food food and mood, and all the relationships with food drama we have, and how to get over that. So welcome to Health Fix Podcast, Jen. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Man, when I looked at your podcast and started listening to you, and I, I saw salad with a side of fries, I'm like, yes, please. Thank you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm guessing you were kind of coming up with the podcast in terms of something relatable, but also something that maybe you'd experienced a few times or wanted to experience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, salad with a side of fries is like my go-to meal. Mm-hmm. And um, that's how it became the name of the show. Mm-hmm. Um, and now over time, it's gotten to the point where like, if that, that doesn't resonate with you, like, I don't know that we'll be friends. Uh, <laughs> just saying. Oh my god! And if you've never had it, no judgment. Now you need to order it and then decide if you're in. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, right. Let, let's face it. Okay. I'm from the Midwest. So, right. Like, I Me grew too. Up in Illinois. Then right. I, moved I grew up in Michigan. Michigan. All right. So, yeah. you know the drill. You know the drill. We're people. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And now, like, you know, with salad with a side of fries, we've gotten fancy now. Like, there's like Parmesan yes. fries. There's like truffle, truffle fries. fries. Yeah. What do you choose? What, how, how do you do it? So, my go to. It depends what the options are. My go-to is a sweet potato fry. Just mm. it kind of hits the spot. But I also mm-hmm. love a good steak fry. Mm. If they're but but I'm picky. So if they come and they're soggy, I'm like, Mm-mm, no, thank you. Crispy. Yes, crispy. Yeah, exactly. My family orders them extra crispy on the East Coast. I live in New York now, so I have to say, well done. When you say extra crispy, they're like, huh? And so, I'm like, <laughs> interesting, interesting. I know. New York, come on, get, get with the Midwest lingo. Extra crispy. We know what that means here. Right. And then right. cheese fries, like no, yes, poutines. Where are you at on those? Like with a side of fries, too much. So cheese doesn't like me. Mm. Uh-huh. So on occasion, okay, but like poutine for me is a challenge because I don't like the sake. Yeah, yeah. So it's like you can maybe get like three or four bites, and then it's and then forget it. So sense. like you got to share those. Yeah. <laughs> I don't do them. Same thing. Cause they can't make them extra crispy. Like, or else I'm just going to eat right. around the edge. That's why exactly. it's not going to work. Same. I feel the same exactly. about nachos. No. Okay. And then salad. What's your choice on salad? I, I got to know. All salad. Okay. I, it depends on the mood. Right. Mm-hmm. But I could go for like an Asian inspired salad or a salad that actually has no lettuce or, you know, just tons of veggies. Mm-hmm. Um, also love a good Caesar. You know, I can go sweet or savory on my salads. Like, I'm kind of a salad connoisseur in the same way mm. that I love fries. <laughs> so, but it's all, the whole premise, right, is that it's all about balance. It's all about, and not, and by the way, balance is not Monday to Friday, my body is a temple, and the weekends, my body is a frat house. Like that's that's not balance either. Mm -hmm. And we've been told it is. We've been led to believe that that's how you figure this out. 
or you have that quote unquote cheat day. And that's not what I'm saying with salad on the side of fries. This is good to know. This is good to know. Because yes, there is the cheat day culture. I usually cringe. I'm like, oh. Uh. I know. Because yeah, the weekend for a lot of us, I mean, I... I've been a naturopath for a while and you know you look at the you look at people's meal you know or they meal recall and like everything's cool and then they get to Friday and then the, then all of a sudden you're a priest and it's confession and they're like and so you know we went to brunch and then after that you know oh so it's a hard gig to find you know what to do right because there's so much information out there so of course I like to bring folks in that like can help us figure out what in the world to do in this department so one of the things that you and I talked about before I hit record is the hangry thing the like getting ourselves yes. too hungry because ladies be loving to like be like I'm I'm intermittent fasting until the point mm -hmm. that I'm so freaking hungry that I'm gonna eat everything that works right yeah. tell us <laughs> okay what's your, so what's your take give us a scoop okay so I have so many thoughts I'm like where do I start let's just start with the idea of intermittent fasting first. Okay. Okay. Throw science and biology to the wind for a second and go with me on this. A vast majority of the American public does not meet their daily nutrition requirements, minimum nutrition requirements, given 24 hours a day to eat. Yeah. How... Do we think that's going to happen in shorter and shorter and shorter windows? Mm -hmm. Just saying. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then we take into account that women's bi biologically women bodies, if that was even English, but you know what I mean. I'm following you. I got it. Have hormone biochemistry shifts every single day. So, right, because not just over life when we have, you know, puberty and then perimenopause, menopause, right? We also have a 30-ish day cycle. Mm -hmm. So which means literally every single day, our biochemistry is different than the day before in order to progress through that cycle. So you're not losing your mind when you wake up in the morning and you feel completely different. Like that's actually biochemically true. So <laughs> given that, we also need to support all of that biochemistry with nutrition. Uh -huh. And especially women with those hormones, depriving our body of nutrition does not signal health. It signals stress and scarcity and famine. And that puts our body into protection mode, into survival, into you're not going to kill me. I will survive. And the way I will survive is holding on to everything you give me as fat so that I can survive in this famine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So our body, better choice for health. Now, if you just want the number and the scale to move in the downward direction for a little bit of time, great, go for it. Eat less, right? What you, we lose when that happens, the number and the scale goes down, but what we're removing is water, muscle, and bone. Mm -hmm. The opposite of improved health, the opposite of improved metabolism. So if we're going to do this in a way that promotes health and longevity and joy for that matter. Yep. <laughs> right? We need to eat. Mm -hmm. So my recommendation is to get fuel in your system within an hour to 90 minutes of waking up. And we want that first fuel to be high in protein. You can also do fiber from vegetables or sometimes fruit and even some quality fat, but making sure that we get the protein at the start of the day. Now we need protein throughout the day, but especially at that first meal so that we can set the stage of our blood sugar. Mm -hmm. Because what we also know from all the research is that whether we are burning fat or storing fat, it's tied to blood sugar. Yeah. And if our blood sugar is too high and if our blood sugar is too low, we will be storing fat. 
that hangry comes from our blood sugar being too low to the point where our body is so deprived of nutrients that we can't even make what we need to be in a good mood. Our body is signaling food now. And when that happens, because we need fuel to the brain as quickly as possible, what is it that we crave? We crave- Hot. <laughs> yes, the carby, sugary, high glycemic things because they're fast fuel. That's what's mm -hmm. going to get fuel to the brain as quickly as possible. Yes, yes. So you're not broken when you have those cravings. You're not broken when you're hangry. <laughs> it's more about us realizing what's actually happening so that we can then respond to what's actually happening versus how that's making us feel in the moment. Incredibly important, incredibly important. And one of the things I did notice, because, you know, I, I kind of jumped into the fascinating thing to see because I'm an N1, yeah. I'll try anything and see what happens. But, yeah. you know, it worked well for a while, of course, you know, and then when life got busy and I was like, oh, I'll just not eat because, you know, it's easier. I don't have to eat. Then I'll try to get all my protein in at night. I couldn't, like you said, it, it, it just was too much. And I was like, I'm so full. And then I go to bed and can't sleep because I was trying to shove everything in by 8 p.m., you know. <laughs> And so it becomes a problem. And, and it's also not how the body works. The body doesn't say, oh, I store the chicken as protein for use later. The only way to store for later is fat. Uh -huh. So if we're trying to cram everything in and hope that it's going to last us later, you know, it, to be our fuel for later, it's not really understanding how the body works. Now, the intention is that you then induce the body to use fat as fuel. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But given the way most people approach intermittent fasting, or even keto for that matter, we don't actually induce the body to use fat as fuel. And so we're actually to better use fat as fuel is to get to a place where we're keeping our blood sugar balanced in this middle range. You don't need a constant glucose monitor, right? We can do this with our food choices. And then eating regularly throughout the day, we can keep our blood sugar in a middle range where we're never storing fat. Then over time, as we're consistent with that, the body will be like, wait a minute, it's never a time of famine. I'm okay. I don't need the fat stores that I've been holding on to, and it will release them. This but our inconsistency and the, sorry, our inconsistency and the extreme that we expect of ourselves creates that inconsistency and then creates the situation where the body is always storing fat. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have seen that with myself you know, trying different things. Definitely the biggest one. I, I have a craving for fats. Like I love yeah. fats. And so I would love to hear, cause I hear this from other women too. Like I, if I, if I could be a squirrel, for example, nuts, seeds, macadamia nuts, like all of them, please. Thank you. I'll just eat them. So tell us like, what's the body doing when it's like, I just want fats. I just want these things. It could be a combination of things. I mean, a lot of times that happens our body communicates to us through these cravings. Mm -hmm. Some of us genetically have variations in our genes that make us more likely to crave certain foods. Mm -hmm. And there is, in fact, nothing wrong. The fact that we can even interpret our body's cravings is an absolute hands-down win, right? So if you can identify that my body is craving fat, it means you need it. Maybe you need it for your brain because our brain is made up mostly of fat. Meanwhile, also recognize every cell in your body has a fatty membrane around the outside of it. Mm -hmm. So it is literally cellular health to make sure that we are having healthful fats. So it could mean a whole host of things. The thing I would say is like we don't have to obsess about it, but follow that. If we notice we're craving those things, if we notice we need those things, take a look and be like, have I not been eating enough fat lately? Where am I missing it that now my body is signaling me that it needs it? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So what we want to do generally is have like two to four servings of fat a day and a serving, by the way, like a serving of avocado is half the avocado. 
So everybody who's like, they always say to me like, oh, I had a quarter of a sliver, a sliver of a half of an avocado. And you're like, huh? Right. Like eat the avocado, eat half of the avocado. You're going to feel so much more satisfied and you're giving your body nutrition that it needs. It's, it's hard with the fat thing, right? With especially our age range, somewhere be anywhere yes. between like the thirties and, and uh, on up, because we've all grown up in the world of like low fat things of that nature. I yeah. don't think, I think my fat cravings are coming from a dep deprivation of fat since I was probably like could remember um because my mom was low fat everything right and right well we grew like i grew up in it too right it was we had, first of all my house growing up had every diet under the sun you know um the study there was one study <laughs> that was very poorly done and had been debunked but it got a lot of press and that's what happened with that made fat the enemy mm. that is not the enemy in fact what ended up happening is when we remove fat from foods, in order to help them satisfy, in order for them to still be palatable, what was added? Sugar. Mm -hmm. Right. And in order to remove fat, they are highly processed because that's not nature. Mm -hmm. Right? So now we have an increase in all these processed foods. Well, less omega-3, the healthful fats, increase in refined processed foods, uh -huh. right? Increase even in saturated fats because that's a lot of times, you know, what ends up added back in to help maintain the shelf life of a food that's been sort of denatured, right? Yeah, yeah. It ends up in a place where it's metabolically unfit for the human body. And like going to this idea of being hangry or moody or whatever we want to call it, right? The, that combination of decreased omega-3s, increased refined foods and processed foods, increased saturated fats leads to a decrease in brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, right? Decreased BDNF is associated with anxiety and depression, cognitive decline, and metabolic disorder. Like it is no coincidence that this is what we're experiencing because of what we've done over the years. Yeah. Yeah. And so by that token, there's nothing wrong with you. This is in fact, exactly what we would expect. So like you're not broken and mm -hmm. it's totally fixable. It just takes a different information set to adjust those inputs. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Cause most, I mean, I'm probably there, there's a lot of women that are like, I crave fast, but I'm scared of them. You know, there, there's a lot of that. And, and even still to this day, I, you know, what happened when we were kids, we were kind of wired right in my house too. every diet under the sun. Of course, as I, you know, got older, I was like, okay, mom, I'll go on these diets with you. And I noticed like, yep. I go back and I see like my weight started to go up as soon as I started doing that with her. Yep. Yeah. <sighs> and like, we've all been there, but the way the human body works, like taking sort of fat in general and sort of breaking it down, like a lot of that stuff, right? The low fat, no fat thing was about cholesterol mm -hmm. and heart disease. Mm -hmm. Well, let's understand the body produces cholesterol. The body wants to maintain, and I'd have to, I have to go back and look. I want to say the body wants to maintain like five grams no, that might, maybe it's 30 grams, whatever. The body wants to maintain a significant amount of cholesterol. And if we aren't eating it, the whatever we eat, the body produces the rest. Uh -huh. So you're not eating the egg yolk. Only means the body is producing more cholesterol to keep the cholesterol level at what it needs cholesterol to be in the body. Where we, where we do have a challenge in the human body with fat is with the kinds of fat that the human body cannot make. Mm -hmm. So those are called essential fatty acids. By the way, fun fact for anybody, anytime you hear the word essential connected to a nutrient, it means the body can't make it. We have to take it or eat it or get it somehow from the outside, right? The kind of essential fatty acids that the body can't make are omega-3s and omega-6s. Now, 
we actually get a lot of omega-6s through our nutrition with the way most most of us eat anyway. Uh Threes and sixes need to exist in the body, ideally for optimal health, within a certain range of proportion. The average American, because of all of these things that we've done and what our food supply looks like now, are way out of proportion. We're like 40 times as many omega-6s as what we really want in the body. I've seen that. (laughs) Yeah. So the objective with the fat is to have the omega-3s to bring that proportion back into balance where we want it to be for the body to function well. Makes sense. So quality fat, omega-3s. Okay. So obviously, you know, a lot of us have a little brain damage in this department and omega sixes, like we're talking seed oils. And so yeah. I would, I would love for you to kind of give folks a breakdown, like, because let's face it, we go to the doc, anything over, you know, 220 at, on a total cholesterol and LDL that's anywhere over like 110, they're tripping, you're getting statins. And, and so in my world, it doesn't happen. Um, But, you know, I'd love for you to kind of talk through like, all right, well, if someone finds right now they have excess cholesterol and they're like, I'm really eating healthy, is it that maybe they need more of the omegas and then the body won't make as much of its natural cholesterol? That I would love to there's, hear you kind of outline that for folks. Yeah, there's a couple of things. I mean, certainly, yes, we want to add the omega threes to increase our HDL. Uh-huh. Then with the LDL, right, we also want to help our body eliminate that excess cholesterol that it doesn't need. Some of us are really good makers of cholesterol. Some of us are really good transporters of cholesterol. So what we want to do is actually increase our soluble fiber to help all of that cholesterol, the excess cholesterol that the body doesn't need to pull it out of the body. Okay. Okay. And balance blood sugar. So a lot of times we think cholesterol is connected to fat. More often, cholesterol is connected to blood sugar. And what creates a problem is not necessarily having LDL cells, right? LDL cholesterol in our bloodstream. The problem is when they end up sticky. So they can end up sticky from blood sugar. And then also They can almost like the LDL, almost the edges of it, the the outside of it can end up um, almost like scraped. Mm -hmm. And that makes it all conducive. And also like your blood vessels can end up scraped. And that makes it conducive for those cholesterol cells to get stuck Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the arteries. And that is when we have a problem. So LDL isn't necessarily inherently a problem. It's oxidized LDL that is more of an issue. So a couple things that I always recommend to my clients. Number one, when your doctor wants to put you on a statin, ask them for 12 weeks. Okay. Say, would you be willing to give me three months, 12 weeks to work on this with nutrition and lifestyle? And then let's test again and see where I'm at. Mm Mm-hmm. I have never had somebody's doctor say no. It's more that they don't know how to tell you what to do, so they don't offer that as an option. Yeah. Right? So number one, we want to ask for 12 weeks. Then we want to focus on, and I say this all the time, protein and fiber at every meal makes your moving fat no big deal. Mm -hmm. Protein and fiber at every meal makes your moving fat no big deal. Protein is clean, lean protein, whatever you want that to be. Don't eat what you don't like. Okay, fiber is vegetables and sometimes fruit. A meal is any time we eat. Whether The only difference between like a meal and a snack is how much we have at a time and therefore how long it's going to last us till we need to fuel again. The other thing we need every day, which we talked about, is quality fat. And one day I'll figure out how to get the fat part into that little sentence. But (laughs) protein and fiber at every meal. So we're going to work on that. We're going to work on building muscle, increasing our activity. We're going to work on increasing our fiber and particularly soluble fiber to help pull that cholesterol out of the system. And 
I will bet that those cholesterol numbers will come down. Mm -hmm. I see it over and over and over every client I've ever had. Hmm. And if your doctor does put you on a statin, you must, 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 must be taking coenzyme Q10. Yep. Need that for those muscles there and the heart. Jake and Steph from Troop Functional Mushrooms have given you a little gift for listening to this podcast. If you enter Health Fix 20, you can get 20% off your order of Troop Functional Mushrooms. All right, let's get back to the podcast. Now, I have a question because this is one I get a lot of times, you know, with the fiber thing. And for a lot of people, they're trying to figure out what their sweet spot is with their fiber. Some people have some gut stuff. So they're like, I don't know if I can do the fiber. What is your, what do you, you know, what kind of things do you recommend for being really good fiber for somebody that struggles to get in a lot of veggies? What would you say? Like, what's the, what's the answer? We progress over time. You will not, the expectation that we're going to go from today eating one or two vegetables a day to tomorrow eating 12, Mm -hmm. right? That's why it feels impossible. So, we're going to go over time. That also, that increase over time is also going to help with the gut stuff. And by the way, a lot of the gut stuff is connected to the dysbiosis or a lack of fiber. Fiber is the food for the healthy gut bugs. Mm -hmm. So by avoiding that, we're creating the perfect storm for continued gut disruption. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So over time, slowly increase the vegetables. What does that look like? Maybe the first step is just to say, can I get a vegetable or a fruit every single time I eat? No matter what, just one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe that might even be too much. Maybe the first one is like, okay, tomorrow I'm just going to have one at one more meal than I have today. Fine. Right. Then we might want to think about variety. How many colors can I get on my plate? Let me tell you, colors come from vegetables and fruit, not from your protein, right? So if we just focus, like I do with my kids and family program, on how many colors can we put on our plate at a time, we're going to increase our intake of vegetables and fruit. Uh Uh And we can build, right? One of my favorite things is a breakfast salad. Now, everybody's like, I'm sorry, you eat salad for breakfast? Hear me out. I thought it was wild and I was like, oh no, <laughs> I don't know. That's too far. And then I tried it once and I was like, oh my goodness, I feel amazing. Mm-hmm. I have so much energy. I feel so satisfied. It lasts me hours. So a breakfast salad, whatever greens you have in your kit, in your refrigerator, in your kitchen, throw them in a bowl. Whatever vegetables you have, chop some up. I like a lot of different things in a salad at once. I think it makes it much more interesting. So a little bit of a bunch of different things, throw it in the bowl. Then I make eggs and I keep the yolks running. Mm, The runny yolk, exactly. The runny yolk becomes like a creamy salad dressing. And then you could add avocado to get some healthful fats. You could add a little bit of olive oil. Or just do some balsamic vinegar, the creamy yolk with balsamic vinegar. Also, everything bagel seasoning keeps it feeling breakfast. Mm, Nice, nice. Right? So over time, we can get to that. But if we simply start with one more, just one more. And by the way, also some of the gut discomfort can happen if we try to go from zero to 40 grams of fiber in a day. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. I mean, I definitely yeah. get a lot of questions about that. And and then, of course, there's also the, well, can I just take the fiber powder granules? And then there's also, <laughs> um, you know, things like the, the greens powders. Doesn't that yes. count? Because I'm eating vegetables. I'd love to hear so, you on that. Okay. Sometimes a fiber powder can be really helpful. In certain situations, but it is not a substitute for eating 
whole foods. You cannot supplement your way out of poor nutrition, no matter what your supplement is. Mm -hmm. So with a lot of the fiber powders, it may have the fiber. It doesn't come with the vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and other nutrients that the vegetables give us. Also, a lot of fiber powders are made from one source of fiber. You know what happens when we eat a variety of fruits and vegetables? We get different types of fiber. Mm. A lot of fiber powders can take out all the good stuff and the bad stuff in the gut. It doesn't necessarily differentiate. Our body knows what to do with fruits and vegetables. So that's one piece. On your greens powders, you now have sort of the opposite situation where they're trying to give you vitamins and minerals and not the fiber, right? I'm all for a multivitamin. I do a lot with supplementation in my practice, but also the idea that we can just have this one thing and not eat for nutrition is like saying, Oh, I, I can just sit all day and never move my body because I went to recess once in second grade. It, we know that that is not the case, right. <laughs> right? right? It's kind of the same thing, right? Those things do not take the place of eating nutrition. They are designed to fill in the gaps where our nutrition falls short because our food supply isn't what it once was. The quality of our food isn't what it once was. So it can fill in some of those gaps, but it cannot completely replace. Makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. Yeah, you know, it's it's something that we're all looking for hacks, right? Because we've come into the society of hack this, hack that, you know, what's yeah. going to work here, what's going to work there. What's what's your favorite hack that you've heard? Like, not doesn't have to, it's like funny or just like maybe in a pinch. <laughs> where it's, what, what's your favorite food hack that you've heard so far? Maybe they're comical um, or it works. Yeah. Oh, this is a good question. I think bulletproof coffee. Okay. I, I just, what? Right. <laughs> like my favorite thing about it is everybody's like, oh no, it's okay that I haven't eaten all day. I had bulletproof coffee. I've heard that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So you gave yourself caffeine and fat, thinking that we were going to induce the body to burn fat as fuel without giving it proper fuel. And then for most people, like the MCT oil or the butter or the things that they're adding to that coffee are not the fats that are going to help improve that omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. They're not the fats that are going to help the body do what it needs. And... They exacerbate the issue. We think that it's going to allow us to burn fat as fuel, but then it often becomes the excuse for eating things that are non-compliant because we're making up the difference with this added fat. And it doesn't seem to me to be a recipe for health, and especially for women, if we have coffee or caffeine before food, we are setting ourselves up for metabolic and hormonal tornadoes. <laughs> like, whoa, whoa, yeah. let's, let's talk about this a minute because um, <clears throat> I laugh at this statement and, you know, people will be like, oh, I'm doing a dirty fast. That's, I guess the, the code term for bulletproof coffee these days, the cool kids call it that. So I'm like, oh, oh okay. I have to look this stuff up sometimes. Cause I'm like, I don't know what dirty fast, I know. Is clean fast. Like, are you not eating organic? You know, my brain right. is like, <laughs> I'm so confused, but like, what was dirty? Do you not shower? Right. Like, <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> right. <laughs> don't tell me. Never mind. Don't tell me. Um, right. But but like with the with the concept of caffeine before food and and the met metabolic tornado, I want to know about this because I I'm not sure I know many women that don't get the it's like coffee first then life. So right. Do tell. Coffee with food, fine. Coffee before food, not our friend. Mm -hmm. So naturally, cortisol, we know cortisol to be the stress hormone, mm -hmm. right? 
cortisol is naturally highest in the morning. It is actually what gets us out of bed. Mm -hmm. It is amazingly helpful. To then add caffeine to a time when cortisol is already high, it sends our adrenals into overdrive. Mm -hmm. And then we think of, so it used to be, it used to think of it as the HPA axis, right? Yeah. The hypothalamus pituitary adrenals. Mm -hmm. By the way, all of that connects to then thyroid. But also it's now often referred to as the HPA GG, including gut and gonads. Mm -hmm. So if we're experiencing gut disruption, if we are experiencing challenges around sexual health, it can all be connected. Sleep cycles, stress, um, weight loss resistance, right? All of these things can be connected to this storm that we create by taxing the adrenals every single morning. We're just hitting them, running on this cortisol adrenaline mix. Hmm. Wow. So if we can start the day with protein, fiber, maybe some quality fat, and have the coffee with it, it is a very different chemical experience in the body for all of these organs and the hormonal function. This is interesting because a, a lot of people, the, the older we get, you know, we see different trends. And for sure, I'm starting to see, I, I can't drink coffee. I can't do caffeine at all. I'm not a coffee I, person really either. I'm, I have to like once in a while, I'll really crave it, but it's not my first thing in the morning thing. And by the way, this isn't just coffee, it's caffeine. So if you're a tea person, if you're, you know, a mm -hmm. whatever caffeine drink person, mm -hmm. it still counts. Still, no. And I see it, you know, I mean, working in the Pacific Northwest for so long, I mean, it's dark here. There there needs to be something to wake up. I, I totally respect everybody and, and their need for the coffee thing. But what I've been seeing as a trend as, as women get older is that gut issues seem to worsen with the yeah. coffee. We take the coffee out or we mix the coffee with the food and now things are better. And so this makes me think a little bit more on that gut, you know, the HPA, GG, element OP. Yeah access. Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and it's interesting because partly I think because of like Western medicine, we inherently look at everything individually because mm -hmm. our medical system tells us that we go to a different doctor for this thing versus that thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in what you do, <laughs> right. And you have different background and education than I do, but even still, we tend to look at things as a whole, because nothing in nature exists in isolation and nothing in the body exists in isolation. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, the more symptoms we have, almost the easier the solution, because one thing, one small change can have a whole cascade of impact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in the morning, because I grew up in Michigan where it's just gray mm -hmm. all winter. Mm hmm but one of the best things we can do for our energy in the morning and for our sleep-wake cycles, right, is first morning light on our eyes. And that doesn't mean don't like open the window and stare at the sun, right? But even if it's gray and overcast, look out the window, get that light into your eyeballs. Don't wear sunglasses. You have to like, you know, look outside. <laughs> <laughs> um Get that light into your eyeballs and see what happens with your energy. The more in the morning we keep ourselves in like these dim, li dimly lit rooms and, you know, quiet and all the little things, the harder it is to wake up. We're sending our body very mixed signals. So I actually switched to one of those alarm clocks that like has the light that gets brighter. So you kind of wake up before the alarm a little bit. Oh, nice. Um, changed everything. I have a much easier time waking up in the morning. Mm -hmm. Even though that's like fake light, <laughs> it makes it a lot easier to wake up in the morning. Still works. Still works. I Still mean, works. Yeah. We use them here, you know, in the Pacific Northwest. It's like almost, yeah. I feel like most people should have one. Like we home, it's yeah. like the happy light plus the wake up light. Right. No, you need it. You need yeah. it. 
And, you know, that's one thing definitely that I've started to really hone in on on folks and realize that it's it's how we wake up and it's not necessarily the Folgers in our cup. Um, you know, the thing it's it's really the circadian rhythms are a huge thing. Right. What's right. what's your jam for the evening and wind down routine and like helping folks in that aspect? Yeah. So interestingly enough, the easiest, call it a hack, the easiest way to improve our wind down is to actually just wake up at the same time every day. Hmm. The nighttime can start to fall into place if we just wake up at the same time every morning. And then the opposite, right? Then we start to dimly light our space in the evening, mm -hmm. right? Keep your room cool. All the things that we've heard before, right? Maybe you take a shower. Taking a shower draws the blood to the surface of the skin, which lowers the core body temperature, which helps us sleep. The blue light away, <laughs> right? By the way, so blue light, talking about morning, getting morning light, seventh grade science, blue light, light spectrum is the closest to sunlight on the light spectrum. So when we're in bed staring at our phones, it's giving blue light to those eye receptors that signal it's morning because it's the closest to daylight. No wonder we have a hard time turning off the phone, laying down and going to bed because we just sent daylight signals to the brain. Mm -hmm. And that's also a big piece of nighttime eating. Hmm. So think about it. We're sending daylight signals through the eyeballs, but our brain and our body are tired. Mm -hmm. And those mixed messages say, wait, I'm really tired, but you're telling me it's daytime. If I got to stay up, I need food for energy because I am exhausted. Mm -hmm. Well, if I'm going to stay up and you're telling me it's daytime, I need food. And what's the food that we're going to crave? Oh, it's sugar because it's always fast. Yeah. Exactly. Always those carbs. So especially if nighttime eating is a challenge, take a look at your blue light. Take a look at some of your habits. Also, nighttime eating is often connected to a lack of protein in the morning and throughout the day. Uh -huh. Right? Again, everything is connected. <laughs> when we start to make one switch somewhere, it snowballs into changes in a lot of other places. And those can be really positive changes. Yeah. You know, a lot of what you've brought up you know, we hear a lot, right? But I think we've we've gone past the basics, and and you're bringing things back to like the the basics of what you know. I I look back ac across my career, right, and 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 my career of eating. <laughs> let's 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 be real, right? <laughs> right? Like <laughs> totally. I, I'm I, with you on that. Yeah. I look back at it and I go, you know, I learned all these things, right, about the protein and whatnot, and even in school. And then we got the like bulletproof coffees and the in intermittent fastings and all these things threw in. And of course, you know, being a doc, I'm like, I have to test it, you know, see if there's, there's something here. Yep. Right. And I always test it because I want to know too, right. If there's some, some little hack, right. Cause that's I want to be able to say to somebody, Oh, I did that. And this is what happened for me. Right. Right. I exactly, yeah. exactly. And while I know that I'm not, you know, everyone, we're all individual. It does seem that coming back to the basics, protein has been, you know, on repeat here in the podcast, but also on, if you go back to the basics and, you know, yeah. and, and really, like you're saying, get the day started off right with the protein. And then in the evening, you're not going to want that, that stuff. And I see it over and over again in myself too. If I haven't got the protein in the morning, guess what I'm going to do at night? I'm going to be like, where's those dried figs at? Where's those mangoes at? I'm going to dried fruit and nuts. Yeah. I swear to God, I'm a, I'm a squirrel. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And other people would be like, where are the Sour Patch Kids? Right? right? We all have the thing that we go to and it's often connected to something else. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think one of the things I just did an episode called the ultimate biohack and here's, you know, going back to your question of like the thing that makes you laugh the most. I think I'm not anti biohacking. I am anti biohacking at the expense of the fundamentals. Yeah. So I see people obsessing over the cold plunge, 
-hmm. or the infrared light or all of these other things, right? Or taking like NAD supplements and all this stuff. And like, listen, I've taken NAD too, right? There's nothing wrong with anything inherently. But if we are doing all of the biohacks and not focusing on the fundamentals of nutrition, building muscle, sleeping, managing stress, having human connection, enjoying our lives. It is like pouring a thimble of water on a house fire. It will always be one step forward, two steps back. Mm -hmm. It's never going to make the dent that we want it to with these biohacks. If what we're doing is trying those things at the expense of everything else. Mm -hmm. I mean, valuable information, because I think that is what where, what happens over and over again. I've fallen into it. I know a lot of people have. and Totally. And it's, it's important to really think through it. So that all being said, of course, folks are going to be like, okay, Jen, I want to hear your podcast. I want to hear your take on things. I want to get back to some basics. I want to, you know, make sure I am doing the basics. Because I think so many of us have become so far yes. from the basics that we don't even know anymore. Like, I, I think that's probably the number one complaint I get. I, and myself included, you know, you get to the point where you're like, I don't even know what my body needs. I just right. need somebody to tell me at this point. Like, right. Either we don't even know or we kind of know, but we can't bring ourselves to do it. Mm -hmm. And then we're like, well, what's wrong with me? Like, I know what to do. Why aren't I doing it? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um. Well, first of all, I believe the difference between knowing what to do and actually doing it is understanding why. Mm -hmm. We want to do it. And so I hope that that's what came through in today's conversation is a little bit of the why so that we can mm -hmm. then connect the dots and understand the importance of the vegetable over the Twix, right? Um, <laughs> and then where to connect with me. So salad with a side, whoa, let me try word. <laughs> salad with a side of fries. Wherever you're listening now, you will find us there. My website is a salad with a side of fries dot com. All social media, I'm at Jen Trepek, J-E-N-N-T-R-E-P-E-C-K. And actually on my website, there's a little download available for you that's, it's not what to eat, it's how to eat. Mm. So mm -hmm. a little freebie for you there. Yeah. We love freebies. We love freebies. And of course, you know, because let's face it, we all like food in to some extent. And because I've been obsessed with your your title, the salad with the side of fries, now I'm like, okay, Thank Jen, you. we all want to know where is the best salad? One, in Michigan, because I'm close to it. And then two, um, New York, where's the best salad with the side of fries? Got to give us the scoop. Okay. Oh, this is <laughs> so hard. Um, In Michigan, one of my favorite salads is at Leo's Coney Island because we have lots of Coney Islands in the Detroit area. Um, <laughs> it's a spinach salad. And then I put grilled chicken on it. There's also like mushroom. I think there's bacon on it, eggs. And then I get the onions grilled. Mm -hmm. I think it is so delicious to have like warm food on top of a salad. Um, so highly recommend. And then in New York... Oh, Mark's off Madison I'm has some of the best salads. It's the chef from, if you've ever been to Barney's department store when they used to have the restaurant called Fred's. So Mark was the chef at Fred's when Barney's closed, even before Barney's closed, he opened Mark's off Madison. And so a lot of those salads are there. Just the best. So satisfying. Nice. Nice. And his fries, the Belgian fries. Belgian fries. Is this duck fat? Like yeah. what? I no, but it's like the cut. I, I shouldn't say no. I don't know if it's duck fat, but it's like the cut of the fry and then how they make them. So good. Belgian <laughs> fries. Now, now you've got everybody intrigued. And, you know, <laughs> I like to uh, nutrition and, and health sometimes gets so heavy. And this is why I love your podcast. You know, it's it, guys, we're we got to love our food. Right. And we got to like oh, enjoy it. Right. And the relationship with it, you know, it's 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 hard. So many women have such a love. hate. I'm such a foodie. And also like on that token, and we could this could be a whole other episode. But like there isn't a culture in the world that doesn't gather around food or use food for some sort of coping or connection. 
There's yes. nothing wrong with that. The fact it is inherently human that we do that. Not a reason to beat ourselves up. And yes, hot topic. Girl, you we're talking again because I want to talk about meeting around food. <laughs> I want to talk about meeting around food because meeting around food yes. that's a stressor for so many people. Oh my gosh. Before we blow the ads open, guys, we're gonna do another podcast on that one. So I don't want you guys to uh be like, oh gosh, I need to schedule Block out like a whole week. We'll we'll get you guys taken. Right. We'll just stop. <laughs> <laughs> just stop all the things you're doing right now. We're gonna give us a week and we'll we'll turn around for you. But oh goodness. So that means stay tuned, guys. That's that's what that means. So Jen, my goodness, we are gonna put everything for this podcast over at drjcrossnd.com so you guys can get all the links. Awesome stuff here. Thanks for the free free freebie. That's a tough one to say. I look forward to checking out that myself. And um, yeah, next conversation. It's on. I love it. Thank you so much for having me. Such a blast. My pleasure. Hey, fellow health junkie. Thanks for listening to the Health Fix podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.